Hey guys, how's it going? I hope you all had a wonderful day today. My name is Grant, I'm the host of Remington Graphics, and today I'm here with you guys for a tutorial and an overview of the add-on for Blender called Ant Landscapes. Before we get into the tutorial though, I just wanna remind you guys that my procedural pro competition is still going on. You got 18 days left to enter a submission, you'll win some really awesome prizes, one of which is a month-long Render Street 1 subscription. So that means unlimited rendering for an entire month, and it was very kindly contributed to the prize pool by Render Street. If you guys want to learn more or go check out some of the other prizes or the requirements, go ahead and click the link down in the description. It'll take you right there. It's right up at the top so you can't miss it. So if you haven't already, go ahead and enable the add-on by coming up here and clicking File, User Preferences. If you're not already, come to the Add-ons tab, click Search and type in ANT, and you can see we have Ant or Add Mesh, Ant Landscape right here. Just make sure this little box is ticked over here. Once it is, when we come into our menu here, we can go ahead and delete this and we can press Shift A and we have the option to add a landscape down at the very bottom. Now I'm sure you won't have all of these. These are from another add-on that'll hopefully go over soon, but we do have the option to add a landscape. So let's go ahead and add a landscape. And we'll press T to open up the tool menu over here if it isn't already open. And you can see down on the bottom, we kind of have it separated here, but down on the bottom we have this uh, little menu called landscape where we can edit a bunch of different features about the landscape that we're working with. Now you can't actually move or scale or rotate this at all. Essentially you can't touch anything until you're done building your landscape. So let's go ahead and go over some of the things here. We have the option called Mesh Update, which basically chooses whether or not it updates. We have a sphere, which will change it into a sphere, which is basically if you're creating some sort of cool planet or a stylized render, that's good for that. And we also have the option to toggle whether it's a smooth face or not. I like that on. We can change the amount of subdivisions, so I can boost up to 256 if I'd like to get more detail, or 128 to keep it kind of shallow. We can also change the mesh size, and this is a good way to scale it up instead of um, doing the other thing. I'm actually going to scale this up to 4 because we're going to go into more detail with it later. We can also tape, uh, this is actually the most advanced part of this, the type and basis, which is two different types of noise generation um, in Blender that is de then used to displace the texture vertically. So we have multifractal and Blender. So basically what the type is, is it's, actually we'll start with basis. The basis is the base texture that everything's going to be based off of. So you can see if I choose cell noise here, we get these really sharp glitchy looking mountains because that's what cell noise is. It generates textures that look like pixels. Whereas if I chose Veroni, you can kind of see the Veroni texture coming out in there, uh, or Veronoi, I believe it's actually pronounced there. You can, you're gonna see it in this one. Um, but this is the base texture, and then we have the type, which is the texture on top of that. And they're basically mixed together to make different things. And I believe I did the math before, it's really not that uh, hard of math. There's 10 here, and 11 here, and 10 times 11 is 110. So there's 110 different ways you can generate noise here. And I think that's absolutely awesome. My favorite is Blender in Planet Noise because it really just looks like terrain, and it's good if you uh, smooth it out, which we'll go over in a second. Now down below we have the option to, actually here, we'll do this too. Um, let me just change this to distorted noise. No, can't do distorted noise. Here we go, okay. So we're just gonna have to do with this for now. Wait, actually that one looks really bad. Um, Okay, there we go, we'll go with that, because this gives us all the settings that we need to know down here. Anyway, seed basically generates a different seed. It's really that simple. Um, it generates a random terrain every single time, and we can also use things like X and Y offset to move the texture left to right, so if we see a feature that we really like, for example, this peak, and I want it to be centered, what we can do is we can use the Y offset to center it, and now we have that peak centered right in our little view here, and we don't have to worry about it. Hang on, I gotta find something. That looks really nice here. All these are really just, by there we go, hetero terrain, that looks good. All right, and then we can also change the noise size, which this is the same thing as changing the size of a displacement texture. Basically what it does is it scales it up until it stops affecting things. You can see if we lower it down a bunch, it um, basically becomes just a bunch of black and white pixels, so we get these spikes coming up and it looks like some sort of ancient medieval death trap. But I'm gonna set that back to one because this actually looks pretty nice as it is. Next up on our list, we have depth, which basically changes the amount of detail in the texture. So if we change this down to five, you can see it becomes slightly less textured. Three, it becomes even less textured. Two, it becomes a lump. One, it becomes smaller lumps, and zero, it doesn't go down to zero. Um, but anyway, anywhere between five and 10 should be good. You shouldn't have to go over that though. In addition, we have dimension, and basically what dimension is, as you can hear, see here, the fractal dimension of the roughest areas. So the lower the dimension, um, well, the lower the dimension is, the higher the peaks will be and the lower the troughs will be. 
um, and the higher it is, the smoother it'll be. Next up, we have lacunarity, which is basically the gaps in between all the different um, white and black points. So you can see the gap between successive frequencies. So if we change this up, it'll become a lot more clustered. If we change it down, it'll become a lot more spread out. If we set it to one, it does this. So don't set it to one unless you're looking specifically for that, which I have no idea why you would be. Um, anyway, we also have offset, which is, well, as you can see here, raises the terrain from sea level. So that's kind of like height, which we'll go over in a second, but um, really there's no need to change offset. Next up here, we have the actual settings that adjust the like height and different um, properties of the terrain here. So we have invert, which basically swaps the whites with the blacks. So you can see the low spot here will become high and the high spots here will become low. So if we do that, we just swap them just like that. Next up we have height, which is just about the same thing as offset. It basically changes how high and how dramatic the difference is between the bottom and the top. So if we set that to one, you can see it comes all the way up to the top and it plateaus here, which we'll go over in a second. I'm gonna set this to like 0.8 maybe. So we got some of these really steep things, but not a ton of them. I'm actually gonna boost the subdivisions up to 160 as well. So we get a little bit more detail. And we also have offset and what offset does is it changes the vertical placement of the texture. So if you can imagine it's slowly like sinking down to the ground, it's not necessarily changing the actual um, height of it. It's just sinking it down to the ground and putting it back up, which is really useful for creating something like islands. Cause you can see here, we got these peaks and then you can imagine this flat part as the ocean or something else. I don't know. It's really up to you. Use your imaginations. I'm sure you guys can do some awesome things with this. And as I was saying earlier, we also have this plateau option. So if I set the plateau to 0.2, you can see that it completely cuts everything off when its height is higher than 0.2. If I set it to like 0.4, it gets a bit higher before it cuts off. And I set it to 0.6, it gets cut off almost at the top and 0.8 means it's just getting cut off at the very tip top here. Um, setting it to higher than the height will essentially get rid of the plateau altogether. So if I have this set to two, I have the plateau set to two, you'll see that, oh, I guess there is still a bit of a plateau there. Um, but if you set it at least higher, a little bit higher, it'll completely get rid of it. In addition, we can also edit sea level, which you can see kind of makes the land move up and down or the sea level, I guess, move up and down. But really you're better off using offset for this and just moving the mesh down. It gives a better result, plus it doesn't distort the land kind of like this one does. And next up we have fall off. So I'm actually gonna set this up a little bit differently here to have a fall off. Fall off is basically how it smooths out the edges of the plane here. So this is essentially type one is a cubic fall off or not a cubic, but a square or squaric. I don't know. It basically falls off to the edges of the plane in a square shape. If we change it to type two, you can see that it becomes a sphere or a circle, oh my gosh, I'm so 3D in my head. It becomes a circle, so it's a circu circular fall off. If we change it to X or Y, it basically only falls off on the X or Y axis. So you can see it doesn't fall off on the sides at all. It just goes straight there. Same thing with the X. You can see now it's swapped and it falls off on the X axis, but not the Y axis. In addition, we can also turn off fall off or turn off fall off. That's really weird to say altogether, but I'm not going to bother with that because I think it looks really cool with type one fall off. And then we also have strata. And for those of you that don't know, strata is essentially when different layers of rock form. And what it does is it adds these cool ledges to the edge of your cliff, which makes it look a little bit more realistic. And we can change the number right here, strata, to how many strata we want in our scene. So right now there are five, if we change it to two, you can see there's one, two strata. And if we change it to three strata, we can see there are one, two, three strata. There are different types of strata as well. So you can see I have type one strata right now. We can also select type two or type three strata, but it's really hard to differentiate them other than saying that they're different. Anyway, I'm gonna go toy with this for a little bit and we'll see what type of result I get so you guys can get an idea of the true potential of this awesome add-on for Blender. So here is the final result I came up with. I made it in about an hour. However, most of that time was actually spent creating the materials and the particle systems. Very little of that was spent actually creating the terrain. I literally think I spent maybe five or 10 minutes on the terrain total. Anyway, that's about it for this video. I hope you guys learned something new. If you did, be sure to drop a like down below and share this video with your fellow Blender comrades in hopes that maybe they could learn something as well. That's about it for this video though, so thank you all for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Adios!